chosen one! I will take the ring to Mordor. No. I do not know the way. give the people of Earth an ideal to strive towards. They will race behind you. They will stumble. They will fall. But in time, they will join you when the sun comes. In time, you will help them accomplish wonders. Right, here we are again today we're talking about the chosen one and the the motifs that you see this this particular motif why it's there and all that um so before i dive in like i always want to get your your opening kind of thoughts on this yeah well i'm glad to be back um and as always um we've been kind of like going back and forth about talking about this for a little while. Um, and I think it's a great topic, especially now, especially um, it, just given the fact that like superhero movies is so popular, you know, mm -hmm. still. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm, I'm excited to talk about it. I know we discussed Superman a little bit um, mm -hmm. uh, a few weeks ago. So I'm decided I'm, I'm excited to dig in. So the chosen one is a motif that you see a lot in various uh, stories throughout the ages. Um, and the way that I, I define it, there's a lot of different ways you can define it, but um, the way that I've seen it defined and the way I look at it is they have to have a certain number of characteristics for a character to have this quality, uh, to kind of meet the criteria for this motif. One is that they almost always have an unusual birth of some kind. Um, and we'll, we'll get into some examples, uh, in a minute there, there seems to be some kind of connection to the divine or the mysterious with them. Sometimes that gets sci science fictionized into from another world, you know, but it's the same idea really from the mysterious beyond on some level. Um, they, they have some kind of destiny that they have to figure out. 
That's that's a key point of the chosen one motif. Um, they typically are connected to some kind of mission. A lot, a lot of times it's to save the people, save the city, save the world, save the cheerleader, whatever it is. And then they have unusual powers that they just sort of inherit. And there's, there's something unique or special and powerful about them just as a matter of who they are. So what are some examples? I've got a big long list, but I wanted to see if, uh, if your list matched mine. Um, Superman, we mentioned already. He's a great example of that. Um, he now originally Superman didn't meet this motif quite as much as he does now. In his initial iteration, he was just kind of a big strong guy from another planet, and I mean he was um, just kind of beating people up and doing stuff that typically Superman doesn't do anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think over the years he's gotten so ridiculously powerful that that the you know they the comic makers are thinking, you know, I don't know if we should let him do that kind of stuff, you know, but initially he was just kind of a big strong guy. He would, you know, pushing around criminals and throwing them out of windows and all that kind of right. stuff. Um, and as that has happened, the, the chosen one stuff has been layered in, interestingly enough. But what are some other examples that you can think of? Well, I, so I was thinking about, I mean, clearly Star Wars, um, Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Anakin being literally verbally said, you, you were the chosen one, right? right. Bring yeah. balance. Well, he technically did bring balance to the force, but mm -hmm. that pendulum swung the opposite right. way. Uh, and we'll so get that, into that later, yeah. uh, a little bit later about how storytellers will use this and sometimes put a twist on it mm -hmm. to make it to keep it fresh and interesting. Um, yeah. These motifs that you see in the stories are there for a reason. They're there because they work. Mm -hmm. They connect with people. And that's where we're there's some interesting reasons why I think that is, but storytellers have to stay on top of it, right? They can't just keep repeating the same stuff over and over again, right? Because yeah. people get bored with it. You know, even if it is a motif that's very resonant and powerful, they'll be like, ah, eh, you know, he copied that off of so-and-so, you know, mm -hmm. that's what people do, even though everything is a copy of something else. Anyway, right, right, right. You know, yeah. So yeah. who cares yeah. about that? But yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Anakin Skywalker, definitely an example there. Who else? Well, L. We discussed Stranger Things a little bit, but I definitely think that that is a motif that motif that's running through her character. Um, mm -hmm. It's not you pretty. Know, it's not. It's not explicit, it, right? But it's definitely there. Um, yeah, and in fact, Eleven, I think, is one of the most uh, pure expressions of this motif in the sense that they really didn't put much of a twist on it, and maybe that that was the twist: is that they didn't. They just let her be the chosen one, and manifest that. Um, you know, or you could say maybe the twist is that she's so young mm -hmm. and she's so insanely powerful, even as a child. Um, but, and you wanted her to be that age again, if it would have been too, if it would have been older than she is or younger than she is, it would not have worked mm -hmm. because we've got these, as we mentioned in the stranger things video, um, that age is when a whole lot of things are happening in development and we all remember it or we're feeling it if we're, you know, of that age watching it. And so there's yeah. that connection there. And so she's the chosen one version of that age mm -hmm. so any others you can think of well i mean there's a slew of other superheroes that have always been considered you know the chosen one um mm -hmm. but yeah those were my big three going into this conversation oh, okay or big right. four yeah 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 those are and those are good examples so um again <laughs> wonder woman she is a chosen one in her most current iteration so again a lot of we got to remember that a lot of these superhero characters have developed over time, and that's very typical mm -hmm. of um, popular narrative characters. Um, they or you can't look at just the origin and say, well, that's what they really are, because it's just how they start. But then they acquire stuff as people tell the stories over and over again, mm -hmm. and certain elements stick. So that's that stickiness is where the resonance comes in, and it isn't immediately there always. So Wonder Woman initially was just a regular person, Diana Prince. And she just had, you know, these abilities because she was, um, uh, she was immortal, but she was not, um, and she was exceptional, but not what she is now, which is basically a demigod or even a full, just plain old, plain out God. Right. Character, that, that level. Um, in the most recent iteration of Wonder Woman, you've got this business about her being um, chosen to be the God killer 
Okay, so boom, there you are. That's the chosen one. <clears throat> There's a, a destiny assigned to you. There's a task that needs to be done that only you can do. Here's all this superpower that you have in order to accomplish it, so forth and so on. So Wonder Woman didn't start out that way, but now she is, uh, at least in the, the first movie. And there's other versions of this, too, in the comics. Right. You know, <clears throat> all that. Uh, Harry Potter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right? Big one. Let's not forget Big Harry one. Potter. Big one. Again, they bring out the fact that you are the chosen one and they play around with it. Right. So um, Rowling plays with that and does put some twists on it. But he is ultimately the chosen one. Mm -hmm in that story. And um, the question of, of course, to keep it fresh is that it's, it's not initially obvious. There's hints of it at the beginning, but then, it, then she leans into it later on in the series and says, yeah, you are the chosen one. And then immediately they joke about it and make fun of it because <laughs> it's so absurd, right? right, it, it, right. The, on the surface said, well, I am the chosen one, you know, the great scene. Uh, uh, I think it's the fourth one or no, it's the fifth one. Uh, order the phoenix where you know she's only interested in you because she thinks you're the chosen one and harry says well i am the chosen one and she just hits him <laughs> over the head with the newspaper right right right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. but he's right he is yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know but then of course the big thing about being the chosen one which we'll get into in a minute is what do i do with this mm -hmm. you know and that what does that feel like um frodo baggins frodo Frodo is another one. And it's again, it's not real in your face. And Frodo, the twist on that one is that Frodo is not super powerful, at least not in the usual way. Uh, Tolkien had a particular message that he wanted to get across that power corrupts. And so uh, aside from characters like Aragorn, where the power is earned uh, many, many times over and, you know, he is pure of heart and all that kind of thing. Most of the time, Powerful characters are corruptible and all that. And so Frodo's superpower is that he is a hobbit, but also he's got tremendous willpower and um, intelligence. And so that seems to be the, the gifts that he have, but they're understated. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, they're understated so much that they're hardly even there. Right. You know, but they are in the books. But, uh, but he's chosen, right, to carry that burden. And they say that several times. Uh, you were meant to have the ring. Meant by who? Right. Well, probably Iluvatar or the Valar or those guys, you know, way up in the <laughs> way up in the chain, you know. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that hobbit, I think, yeah, he's got it. Yeah, that guy. He yeah, yes, that guy. he's yeah. the one who needs right. to find it right. so he can deal with this right. 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 Sauron guy and his, you know, shenanigans. Uh King Arthur, especially the Excalibur version. Uh, King Arthur is one of these characters that's been around forever and ever. Um and yet is still going. There's still something powerful about that character and the Knights of the Round Table and Merlin and all those guys that you see, even if every few years you see another version of this. Right. Um, there was the Merlin TV show that was for that went on for about four years. Uh, <clears throat> and again, same idea. Then there was the Cursed TV show that just came out um, maybe a couple of years ago now, I guess, uh, on Netflix. That was about Nimue, but King Arthur and Merlin and all those guys are still right, in. right, right, yeah, right. And so they, they keep playing around with it and all that kind of stuff. But the characters continue to live on and be relevant and interesting to people enough to make more of them, even though there's so many movies that have bombed <laughs> with King Arthur, like um, the one that Guy Ritchie directed, which I actually like. I right, actually, I thought that was pretty good. I thought yeah, that was pretty good. It, yeah. Apparently, it bombed, and they were they were planning to do sequels. They want to make a big yeah. franchise out of it, but it just tanked which I don't understand that. I, I, I really like that movie, but there you go. So, but there's still more people interested in, in that, that kind of thing yeah. to make more movies out of it. You know, uh, let's not forget probably one of the biggest characters from mythology, history, religion, all of all time. Jesus is Jesus, a chosen yeah. one. Jesus for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, where in King Arthur case, uh, particularly the Excalibur version, which I think is a, a really, really powerful one by John Borman. Uh, he's a chosen one, but he failed. But he failed honorably. And there, at the end, you know, there's always that thing, well, one day the king will rise again. That's a very common motif um, for another day. <laughs> for another day. Uh, but then, of course, then you've got Jesus, and Jesus seemingly failed, but then really didn't. Um, like, the, perhaps the greatest reframe of all time 
Uh, well, you know, he was crucified, but actually that was the plan the whole long, all the whole, right, you know, right, all right. the time, right? And um, that whether you believe that or not, or if you're devout or whatever, um, I, I'm just, I'm not intending to insult anybody's religion, but the, the power of that narrative structure in and of itself is, is very potent, obviously. Um, that motif has been was very popular back in the time when uh, Christianity was developing. Actually, there's a whole lot of these kind of mess messianic characters. Again, another subject for another day, the savior kind of character. Soul Invictus, the, the sun god. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yep. yep. right, Mithras and all these yep. guys. Um, but uh, in that case, there was he was connected to divinity. He was literally the son of God. He had a mission to accomplish, save the world, right? Um, he had a mysterious destiny that he, you know, even at points during his story in the New Testament, you can see that he struggles with this uh, at times, which you'll find in all these other chosen one stories too. I've got, I've been given this huge burden and, and what am I supposed to do with this? Mm. Do I accept it? Do I fight it? Do I run away? All of these kind of things, you know? Um, and they have unusual powers inherited. Mm -hmm. Same with Jesus. You know, he could heal the sick. He could raise the dead. He could do a walk on water, all this stuff. So, um now here's here's the next question right what about characters that are not the chosen one all right maybe some examples there I, we, before we started i was saying batman which i think is not the chosen one um and maybe you can see why i think that at this point um he he does have semi-divine gifts being the fact that he is stinking rich right you can look at that as as kind of his superpower um but there isn't the connection to the divine that's really there. And unless you picture, you know, um, Thomas and Martha Wayne as sort of a stand in for divine figures because they're so idealized. Um, recent iterations are still kind of, they're making them a little bit more human. Yeah. Like with the most recent Batman, how he, he was still a good person. He, he wasn't a bad guy, but he made a mistake, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, I, I really like that. But generally speaking, you know, you don't see that connection with the divine so much. There's not so much the mission. He picks the mission. Right. So it's tr it comes from within him. I'm going to do this. I mean, honestly, uh, how many billionaires live in the world? Like 500 or so. Not a single one of those schlubs have become <laughs> Batman. <laughs> yeah, that's hell? true. Yeah, yeah. We got all these Lex Luthers running around, yeah. but no Batman. I know. I know. I know. It's sad. <laughs> it's sad. They got they, they need to step up their game. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, he's still working on his purpose, and a lot of the in the comics and the stories. That's what makes him interesting. He's yeah. he's he's not the chosen one. Not you know, chosen one's interesting on its own, but his his story is different. Is different from that, and it's also interesting. Um, some other characters that you think are like super popular that seem maybe like they're chosen one characters, but aren't. Um, well, you mentioned Beowulf, but I was also thinking about Gilgamesh. Um, yeah, yeah. And and you know his his adventures with Enkidu. Um, but Paul Atreides, some Ooh. chosen, definitely chosen <laughs> one, but not chosen one stuff going yeah. on. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, okay. So now we're getting a little more sophisticated with Dune because Herbert had a whole lot of meta narrative going on with the with yeah, Dune. right. Um, but yeah, um, he is. He is the chosen one, but he's not chosen by God. Right. Chosen by the Bene Gesserit. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily different enough, though, to, I mean, he still kind of qualifies, really. Right. Um, and the twist on that is that the chosen one, Herbert is trying to show us how dangerous that idea is. Even though Paul is a good guy, mm -hmm. he wants to do good, but he gets caught up in the narrative and it's so powerful and so intoxicating that billions of people get murdered in his name mm -hmm. okay so <laughs> that tells us how strong the story is and how, yeah. why the motif is so incredible and in its its narrative thrust and power and why we continually to pay yeah. buku bucks to watch uh, you know the end millionth iteration of this idea <laughs> so um buddha speaking buddha. of religious figures Buddha, uh, now I'm not an expert on Buddhism, but as far as I know the story, he just was a rich dude who decided to seek out wisdom. And he went through 
asceticism, extreme asceticism, and didn't find it there. And, you know, he went through all these various things and then found enlightenment uh, through the Eightfold Path and all that kind of thing. But it, he wasn't sent by the divine. Uh, no. Now, there's versions of this, of course, that turn him into the chosen one, very similar to what happened to Wonder Woman and Superman. Eventually, that sort of pulls like gravity. It just pulls that motif into the character and says, well, he's one of many bodhisattvas. There's been many Buddhas throughout yeah. all, all time and all this kind of thing. So, okay. Then in that case, maybe he's more, more like the chosen one. But Well, I want to bring up Buddha later in terms of okay. how it might... Oh, well, I'll bring it up later. I'll bring All it up right. later. All yeah. right. we'll, we'll, we'll mark that down for later. Uh, Beowulf has divine gifts and this immense strength. Um, although it, the poem doesn't really lean heavily into that. Like you're given the strength in order to accomplish something. No, he's just a big, strong guy. And it's just sort of thrown out there to be amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of purpose behind it necessarily. He still has to figure out what he wants to do with himself. As a young man, he's kind of a, a schlub. He's sitting around. He's an ash lad, right? He doesn't seek out uh, fame and glory. But then later on, he does, and boy, does he! Mm -hmm. You know, he becomes the greatest king. So um, that's not the chosen one. That's more like Batman. That's yep. more like I'm going to decide my destiny. I've got this strength. What am I going to do with it? Not you were given this strength to accomplish something that is coming from beyond, and you have to figure out what that is. That's, di that's a different thing, right? It's a different uh, approach. Uh, Maui, I was just kind of revisiting um, Moana the other day. Oh, yeah, right. right I love right. that. That movie is so fun. Uh, you know, Maui is, he's not a chosen one. He's a culture hero. He's a demigod in some versions of the story. He's very powerful. He's very tricky, but he doesn't have a particular destiny necessarily. He's just got a whole lot of cool stuff. He's just a cool dude and who's accomplished all this really nifty, interesting things, but not a chosen one. So then that leads us to what is the appeal of the chosen one, do you think? Oh, there's so much. It's, it's a divine gift, finding purpose, meaning. Uh, you, it, I think there's a lot of broad ideas around what you do really can reverberate throughout the world, yeah. right? You can change the world. Um, specialness, being special. Mm -hmm. um, and that could very be much a part of that. Yeah, positive and a negative thing, especially mm -hmm. now. Um, right. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, I, I think you're, you're right. I mean, it is so appealing. We tell this story over and over again between, you know, what we've seen not maybe not so far much in the East, but in the West, you know, coming from the Greeks, Hercules, right? The son of a god, Perseus. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the demigods were pretty much the chosen one. It, it might not necessarily end well for them, right? But oh. there was a lot there. Um, mm -hmm. so we well, and look continue. at the example. If you want to use Greek example, we can't overlook Alexander the Great, yeah. who was a living human being who believed he was the chosen one. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, on both and, sides of his, of his family, they were pretty much, they, they claim, or he claimed both sides of his family were, were descendants from gods, yeah. you know? So, mm -hmm. yeah, and at one point said that he would choose glory over a long life. Mm -hmm. And that's what he got. And, his legend lives on. We're still talking about him. Right. And I mean, he's a guy who lived it. He really believed in it. And he, and who knows how much that contributed to his success as a general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, having Philip of Macedonia's battle hardened army behind him with the best weapons in the world probably didn't hurt anything. Nope. But Mas but Philip didn't make it all the way to India in his endless, you know, quest for <clears throat> more adventure and conquest. Yeah. But Alexander did. And I remember I got really fascinated with him years ago and uh, read quite a bit about him. And, um, you know, when he went, it made it all the way to India. He wasn't done. He, ret he returned, he, but he wasn't finished. He was just coming back for a regroup and he had plans to continue on. And according to the historians that I read, they, they think he could have done it. They probably could have if he hadn't just mysteriously died mm -hmm. of some fever, you know, whatever it was, who knows, maybe it was, meningitis or something right right who knows but that so there's a guy who was not a, a fictional character who became <laughs> he turned well, I, himself into yeah. a fictional character i think he he believed that he was the chosen one 
right? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I did a video on on kind of uh, this ego is not the enemy thing, right? And yeah. and Alexander is pretty much saying to Ptolemy, you know, I looking back on it now, I agree more with Ptolemy than I do with Alexander. Yeah. Um, because Ptolemy was talking about home and pretty much love and relationships and how that brings men home. And Alexander was like this, this kind of this complex drive, like just expansion outward. And that it's, it's this quick, almost like match that is lit and it's going to burn bright. And then it's just going to go out. Um, yeah. But your video has made me want to go watch that. I never did get to see that one. That's great. Yeah. I, yeah. I, it's, it's, well, it's, it's, it's watch the, uh, the extended edition for sure. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Watch it's like edition. three plus hours. It's so much better than the, the theatrical. Okay. Uh, yeah. right. It's Oliver Stone, isn't it? Yep. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So there's a guy. And of course, almost immediately after he died, there was a legendarium built around him that fed into this. So that's a, a pattern I talk about it in some of my works about how over time, stories can become more mythical and more fairy tale like because they acquire all these motifs that just sort of pile on top of them. Um, one example I gave was uh, in one of my videos, actually I talk about this. This is the story of Lady Godiva mm-hmm. and how over the years she acquired, and we're talking centuries here and they still celebrate her in Coventry in England. There's a, like a yearly procession really? uh, to celebrate her ride. Uh, they're not naked before you go look it up. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, darn, yeah, right. But um, it's it's really interesting because we have records of the stories throughout the centuries. And, and she was she lived in the 11th century. And all right. So anyway, anyway, the idea is that, you know, you see this stuff pile on. Oh, yeah. Over yeah. Years, over, year, over the years. Um, so I, I think the appeal of the chosen one is the connection with purpose and destiny. Um, I did see an older version of the story of Alexander the Great, the one that was uh, made in the 50s. And there's a, they lean heavily into that idea, too. That And it seemed to be fairly accurate. Um, almost a little bit too accurate because it, mm-hmm. they lost a lot of, I think a lot of the audience got kind of lost in all of the endless conquests and marching and carrying on. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, the idea that there's a destiny chosen for you before you're even born is uh, a very sneakily appealing idea, I think, to a lot of people. Um, so given that, given that, what do you think the, the psychological meaning of the chosen one is? I think it, I, I, if I you were, let me put it this way. Let me put it. Yeah. If you were, if you were working with someone, or maybe if you, you know, you're working yep. with somebody talk, telling you about a dream they had where they were, cho- they were the chosen one, what mm-hmm. would you be worried about or think about or, well, I mean, inflation for sure. This there's there's kind of, a danger there. Yes. Yeah. Inflation for, for I mean, and then the kind of giving into a hyper inflationary, maybe spiritual belief in it, you know, the saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I am destined by a divine power in order to do this, that, and the other. I think that on a psychological level, in a healthy way, dreams and or kind of ideations or fantasy material that's drawing somebody into that can be taken as you are most certainly the kind of main character of your own life, right? Maybe the chosen one of your life to kind of take that in and understand what your purpose is. It's not to say that you are literally the chosen one, right? To say the world. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So I agree with you totally there. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with feeling of trying to understand what my purpose is. Mm. Say, and, um, for some people, that's a very uh, troubling question. For people who are more uh, bent towards ex- existential dread, for example, yeah. you're, like, you're really worried about that kind of thing and you feel like, what's the meaning? What's the point? Uh, some people just don't occupy themselves with that question very much. Other people, like myself, occupy themselves with it a lot. Yeah. And I think it's a lot of introverted intuitives generally are going to be people that do that. So, but the, of course, the danger is inflation, their danger is a power complex. Because the chosen one is always a very powerful person, mm-hmm. whoever they may be. And part of that is um, you have been, it's, the, it's a colorful, exaggerated depiction of something real, like all fantasy is. Yeah. 
And in this instance, it's you have some kind of special talent that is geared towards doing something particular. And you didn't design it or invent it yourself. You just sort of came into the world with it. And uh, if there is a divine or if there's gods or, uh, you know, whatever, the cosmic, you know, cosmic consciousness, whatever you want to say, and you're a part of that whole, then there could very well be an intent or a purpose behind it, or at least a collection of purposes from which you can choose. That can be really healing to someone who is struggling with nihilism, with struggling yep. with feeling meaninglessness and emptiness. Um, it's a way to connect because what I think really leads to those feelings are disconnection. We've talked about this at length, mm -hmm. ad nauseum, of other people and with nature and with, you know, tribe yeah. and culture and family and society and all these kind of things. People that are really disconnected from all that definitely feel that sense of meaninglessness and emptiness. This is other than helping them to try to reconnect and build those sorts of things, which is tough to do sometimes. This is another inner way sort of to cue mm -hmm. into that. Okay, well, maybe what is their purpose? And, and I think inflation is at most dangerous when you're the most disconnected. Mm -hmm. Because then you get this idea that you're stupendously important and all that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. and that, you know, and that just leads to disaster yeah. usually. Mm -hmm. But so you need to have a little bit of it, but not too much, but not zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Moderation in all things. Well, it, belief in the miracle that you're here. And, and, and I mean, it yeah. is a miracle that you're here. It is, yeah. it's a miracle of nature. And I think one of the, you just said it, like a connection with nature is, is important. Um, and a connection with your nature because your nature is purposeful. The inner and the right? outer nature. Yes. Yeah. Um, By nature, I think it's important to distinguish it there here. The inner nature is that which is inherently you, right? So the genome, if you want to get really physical about it. But just the, the collection of things that you inherited as being a part of who you are, that you didn't really do anything to create yourself. It's what you, right. what was brought to you is your birthright. Yeah. Connecting with that is what we're talking about here, because it's not about I can just create my own destiny and make up whatever I want in my little pea brain. That's great. And a lot, a lot of people really love to you know talk like that, but uh, it, it can only get you so far. It can only get because... There's, I think there's a part of the brain somewhere that is just like the BS detector, right? And it's like, you know, you're just making this crap up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and some people, they just ignore that voice and other people are really cued into it and they don't bullshit themselves too much. But uh, that, that's, I think, the danger with self-invention, right? You can do that to a degree, of course. We have the, I think the ego evolved the way that it did with free will and with you know, um, a tremendous freedom of action and variability because the genome needs it. It needs it to accomplish whatever it is, you know, but uh, there is a limit to that. And yeah. if you don't have any, any connection with those things that you inherited, however you view that, then it's just going to be an exercise in, you know, ego fantasy, I think. Yeah, a, a pure cognitive will instead of a kind of more uh, open and subservient opinion or, or, or relationship with, with yeah. the deeper part Something of that, the heart, right? Yeah. The, the unconscious, whatever you want to qualify it as. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, we, we were bringing up Christ and I think in, in Paulian Christianity, there is a lot of, again, the chosen one motif, but, you read something like a what would be considered a Gnostic gospel, um, like the Book of Thomas, and Christ literally says to Thomas, "To know me is to know yourself." Right? Yeah. To, it's it's pretty much suggesting to go inward. Mm. Um, and the reason why I wanted to bring up Buddha again was because of this. I think the underlying metaphysic there is pretty much suggesting that in order for you to get in tune with the divine, do what Buddha did: get in tune with yourself. Right? Get in tune with those deeper parts of you. And I think that's exactly, you're exactly right. Buddha isn't the chosen one, but the path of Buddha is something to potentially take on. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, that that idea of getting in touch with the kind of inner Christ figure is a, a theme in Christian mysticism too, which oh, yeah. a lot of people don't talk too much about. Well, I think it's just because there's so many loud fundamentalists out there, <laughs> you can't hear mm -hmm. it. 
the yeah. more reasonable, you know, explorations of Christian uh, theology, it's just too much. It gets drowned out by the noise. Don't don't look inward. Don't look inward. Don't do it. Don't yeah, do just it. just do yeah. what we say and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Um. So I think that the the what the differentiates a chosen one character from other types of characters is that prefigured destiny. It's not necessarily predestinarian, like it's not inevitable um because that wouldn't be very narratively tense there wouldn't be a whole lot of narrative action there there's always tension though in the am i going to choose this path am i going to take the next step to figure out what the path is and all that kind of thing um this was done i think very well in man of steel for example um superman comes into the world he doesn't know about all this the stuff that we just as the audience saw in the prologue with russell crowe and all that and so he's kind of wandering the world, trying to figure out what he is supposed to be doing. And how many of us have felt that way at one point or another, even though we're not Superman? Um, the idea of putting superpowers on top of that basically ups the ante. And it's a, again, it's an exaggeration of a natural occurring thing, which is I'm trying to figure out what, who am I? It's identity stuff. Yeah. So who am I? Where do I fit in? What am I supposed to be doing? This is a quintessentially human thing. Tigers don't go through this stuff. Tigers wander the wilderness and they say, I'm a tiger. And if you don't like it, it's too bad. <laughs> I don't care. This is my destiny. I'm a tiger. Right, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be tigering my whole life. But, you know, humans, we are not like that. We, we wander the world like uh, Clark Kent does. Yeah. You know, asking himself, I know I'm not. It's a, and again, that feeling of specialness and differentness. Mm almost always feeds into this same thing anakin skywalker 11 has this all these characters have this um the newer iterations of wonder woman same thing same thing i know there's something unique and special about me and there must be some reason so if if you are a person who is gifted in some particular way now it doesn't necessarily have to be iq it can be you know with a sport or some kind of talent yeah. music who knows there i think you're going to go through some of this why am I so much, you know, better at this naturally without even really trying that hard than so many other people? Maybe, maybe there's a point, a purpose, like maybe the forces of the universe want me to do X. The inflation, of course, comes in if, it, if whatever X is happens to be dominate everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> because that I don't think is the point it's at all. Um, a person's purpose could be humble. It could be simple. It could be. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've uh, had folks uh, that I've worked with who had just a tremendous passion for animal uh, welfare, mm. taking care of uh, stray animals, helping them with their medical needs, feeding them, all this kind of stuff. And so many people around them would say, you know, what are you wasting all your time doing that for? You know, you've got all these talents, you've got so much potential and you want to do that. And I said, don't listen to that crap. This is your passion. Yeah. Right. You you earn that. Right. You're you're allowed yeah. to have that. And where is, who's who's going to take care of these animals if you don't? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to do this stuff. Right. This. So this is the universe saying you need to be doing this. You know, that was oh, I distilled a huge amount of discussion with into that you know, like two, one minute. But that's that's important. And, and but it's so it's not so much the powers and not so much, you know, being special and all that kind of thing as much as I think it is finding your place. Yeah. And finding who you are, which is why I think the chosen one motif resonates so much with so many people. Yeah. You know, there's a there's an 11 in everybody. At some mm -hmm. point, you know, you ask yourself, there's some reason why I am the way I am. Maybe that's a, a purpose. Maybe. And it's it's going to always be way more subtle than being able to lift a thousand pounds with your mind. <laughs> Um, because the point of the stories is to entertain. So they're going to crank everything up to right, right. 11. Yuck, yuck, yuck. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you get the idea. Um, I think that it's a, it's a way to depict narratively in pictures and images that feeling of that kind of maybe unconscious feeling in some people that I'm here to do something, but, but what is it? And, and if you don't know what that is, that can be really awful. You know, like I'm always saying, the, the mind is a meaning-making organ. The brain is a meaning-making organ. If I don't know what the meaning is, I'm not happy camper. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think we we get pulled towards the inflationary. We get pulled towards the the absurdly kind of fantasiful ideas. These ideations. It's when we 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 lose that connection. I think you're right. Like the when you, when you have this kind of everything's meaningless nihilistic idea of the world that's mm-hmm. when you're in danger of getting really pulled into something that you might not necessarily want to get pulled into right. um but i think everything is purposeful right and uh, experientially for me i think it is a lot simpler than we make it out to be and these stories on the healthy end show us that yes we all have this purpose we all have this meaning in our lives and it's kind of our responsibility to find it for ourselves so we can give it and, and put it out into the world, not yeah. kind of be this, you know, demigod standing on the top of the mountain saying, I conquered everything. And I, I you know, like this, this, this power complex, like you were talking about, mm-hmm. um, reminds me a lot of just, you know, how, how certain personalities online like to utilize that, that lack of meaning in others and, and really pull that in and say, oh, I can give that to you. And you yeah. are special and you yeah. are this but they're using it. They're manipulating it. And, and right. they're doing and that it for, the, I was going to say that that is the thing that uh, Frank Herbert is warning against mm-hmm. yeah. and being very realistic about how effective that can be and how easy it is to use that to manipulate people. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, he beats, beats that lesson over and over to death yeah. and his stories, but it's very well, you know, yeah. taken. Well, I think Vader too. I think Anakin was a prime example of, mm-hmm being presented, he, he felt this powerlessness. He had these dreams of his, his beloved dying, of, of, of Padme dying, and, and the Emperor and Palpatine, Sidious, right, just really took advantage of that and said, mm-hmm. ha ha, I got you, I got right. you, yeah. What I wish they would have done a little bit more in the prequels if, I mean, the, the twist that Lucas does on that is that the Chosen One ends up being a villain and that he, but in the ultimately in the end he does end up doing what he was chosen to do yeah uh and the the sneaky part about it is that he's chosen to bring balance to the force and he's even said this in interviews was that the prophecy doesn't tell you exactly which side of the force needs to be balanced out Mm. right and so um what i think he meant by that is that he deliberately made the jedi order flawed and in need of rectification, which is why he created the, the uh, why he added the Qui-Gon Jinn character to show what the Jedi should have been doing, but then they rejected him. And then when he died, that was the beginning of the end, really, as is the beginning of the downward spiral for Anakin before right. he was even had a chance, you know. Yeah. But at the, it's, at the end of that, though, you know, he's layered so much into this. If you get too distracted by the 10 year dialogue, you'll miss all this subtlety in the story structure, which is a sad, sad thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, the, the, the additional layer of that is that the, it was really kind of the good guys that needed to be ironed out. Yeah. But the only way for that to happen was mass, you know, reboot of the whole galaxy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, you know, unfortunately that's, I guess some of the forces just kind of like that way. It's like, well, I'm sorry. Shouldn't have let it get this right. Too bad. (laughs) I'm going to send the chosen one after you guys and and look out. (laughs) So well, it's guys, tragic, but at the same time, it's uh, it's kind of an inverse of the Jesus story, where he's chosen and he's tragically killed, but wind up winds up saving the world. It's kind of like if Jesus didn't know that he was in a part of this, you know, like he, mm. if uh, if he had died um, as as a part of some kind of downward spiral into evil, but still wound up saving the galaxy anyway, or the world in this case. Very, very clever. <laughs> very right. interesting twist on that. Mm. And he, and what I was going to say, though, before I got sidetracked on that was um, I wish they had kind of leaned a little bit more into the idea of being the chosen one and what that does to him. Um, with Paul Atreides, there's a lot of that. There's a whole lot of him, of Herbert exploring how him being the chosen one messes with him. And uh, then once you get to Leto the second, holy cow, it gets even really weirder. <laughs> yeah. And he just plunges into that whole process of what does it mean to truly be the chosen one and how much does that really suck? 
and he's he's removed from humanity in a very physical way. Um, but the, you know, the chosen one is always alone. Mm. So with loneliness comes this motif from the unconscious percolating from below to assault you in your dreams and grab you when you see it in, in uh, theaters or when you find these internet gurus, they latch onto it. So if, if I were now, I don't know if this study has been done, but would you say there are more chosen one motifs now than there were a hundred years ago in, in the stories? as a percentage. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah, definitely. It seems like it's all over the place. And I think it's because of a lack of really a truer understanding of it to a certain degree and understanding the simplicity of purpose and the simplicity and meaning and the the simplicity and just kind of, you know, uh, finding it within oneself and that not necessarily being this, you know, one narcissistic grandiose thing, you know, um, Mm -hmm. I, you talked about the prequel trilogy. And I think one of my favorite scenes in the whole trilogy was right before Anakin was going to do his pod race, right? His mother went up to him and she said, Anakin, be safe. Right. And I thought that was, you know, it's a very motherly thing to say. Mm -hmm. Qui-Gon comes up to him and says, trust your instincts. Yeah. I thought I I love that scene because it's Mm -hmm. pretty much an example of both a kind of relatively positive feminine and and masculine presence for, for, you know, Anakin. Yeah. But then he ends up being alone. He loses the positive masculine and the positive feminine in his life. Oh. He loses two parents and that aloneness feeling like it's meaningless, but then having two, this massive projection put onto you by the Jedi, right. Or onto Anakin. Um, you are the chosen one. You're bringing balance to the force, but it's so one-sided, you know? Um, yeah. You're, you're, you're left as an individual without kind of that connection with yourself. Um, you're left kind of at the whims of these cultural projections, these cultural complexes that people will utilize to just hook you in and say, you're yeah. this for me. He yeah. was the chosen one for the Jedi. He was a tool for Sidious. He yeah. wasn't himself. Like if he, if he were to choose, if he were, if he was to have chosen his life, honestly, it probably would have been separate from the Jedi. He would have been with Padme mm-hmm. and, and had his children and been happy. Yeah. Or if the Jedi had not been so rigid. Yeah. You now we could, we could certainly debate that for hours yeah. <laughs> and discuss right. that right. one for hours. I don't think we disagree actually. I think we yeah. agree completely on that, but uh, yeah. Um, you know, as we were talking about in the stranger things video, um, the amount of disconnection that is going on in modern society, modern Western nations, um, I think contributes to this because that kind of purpose and meaning tends to be found in context and relation. And so if you continue to break that down and disintegrate that through various economic factors and things that have happened over the century, last couple of centuries, probably, um, then there's going to be more sense of loneliness, more senses of uh, more isolation. There's, there's a whole literature around this now in psychology about, and psychiatry about the loneliness problem and yeah. how it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and how it contributes to all of this stuff. It's mental and physical ailments. We were not meant to be this way. We, we didn't yeah. evolve like this. So we're talking about a purpose. The purpose is to be connected to yeah. others. And nature has really, really hard, hardwired that in to where we're just not right unless, you know, we've got significant connection there to, to satisfy that. So I think because of that, we're seeing more chosen ones. Yeah, because the chosen one is a way of saying, you know, despite all that isolation, despite all that, you're weird, you're special, you're different, you're off, you know, you're a bizarre creature or whatever it is. Despite all that stuff, there's still a purpose for you that is coming from the the most authoritative source of all God, the universe, the divine, whatever, you know, the Olympus or Asgard. Um, And so that's very appealing. But again, if as we talked about in a different video about the dangers of fantasy, um, if it's disconnected um, from the outside world, if it just stays percolating in here and never goes anywhere and it doesn't do anything helpful. In fact, it can maybe even stifle you because you then, like you were saying, 
one of our videos, you were saying you don't go out there, right? You don't go yeah. do stuff. Yeah. And yeah. you know, one of our conversations we were talking about that, and I totally agree with that. It's so easy to get caught up in in fantastical narratives to the exclusion of okay, but what does this mean for the external world? They're both valid and useful and needed. We need both worlds. If we put a big wall in between them and say, well, it's just you know escapism that doesn't mean anything, then you don't get to advance. You know, you don't use the right. advantages of, that you get from it. You can't do anything with it. And the external world by default then becomes also a whole lot more boring and dull. And this makes me want to retreat from it even more. But that's not yeah. that's not good, you know. And so in that sense, that's why the chosen one is designed so often to save the world, because you're saving the world from meaninglessness and emptiness and nothingness. I mean, you can look at it that way. Do you I just do you thought think, of that? That was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, no, that was. But you, you mentioned like this talking to people that, that wanted to work with animals and had a passion for it, mm -hmm. and that there was a lot of meaning in it for them. Do you think yes. that the and I, I've seen this a lot, like this, this idea that attention and fame, I think that's also increased in modernity, just like this kind of chosen one motif has appeared. There's also an increase of people needing or wanting to be famous. Do you yeah. think those two things coincide? Absolutely, they do, because they both derive from the same thing. Hmm. When you have all this disconnection, you still have a desire for connection. Well, being famous gets you a type of connection. It's it's quick and it's a lot, <laughs> mm. uh, you know. And you can see from celebrity lives that sometimes it destroys a person, actually, um, because it's not really the kind of connection I think that we crave. It's it's a drug. It satisfies mm. you artificially, and so you end up with addictions to it, you, and you end up with overdoses on it as it were speaking metaphorically here but um because it's fame is a fickle thing right as we hear uh and so if you get the sudden rush of it and then all of a sudden it disappears as is want to do in, in hollywood then you can you can see a really kind of crushing effect on on a person if they're not careful and they don't have if they don't have the support network around them right you know, and, and also the emphasis on fame and power, I think, is much higher now than it was even yeah. just 100 years ago when uh, there was such a greater cultural emphasis on community and, um, you know, autonomy and uh, service to others. Well, now it's about, you know, looks and money and fame. Yeah. And it's a very hyper individualized uh, value system. I had, a, I had a conversation with somebody recently about how power in a healthy way is given, not taken, d d depending, right? And mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask you, so how, how is that applicable to the chosen one motif? Because you see it a lot more now, right? Mm -hmm. An increase in this motif, and I absolutely agree. Some of the best chosen one stories are the stories where the chosen one it honestly has an option in order to... And, and it is given is given power through the journey and not necessarily taking that power. Right. And I think there's a lot of issues with the kind of storytelling now where it's just like that person's got everything without any type of challenge whatsoever. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, yep, they have all the power. They, they, it's, it's, it's just, it's innate within them and they just mm -hmm. go out and they take it. Right. It's not even, they don't even have a struggle. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I think some well, of the and, best and ones. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the problem with the sequel trilogy with the Ray character, who was supposed to be kind of the chosen one of the sequel trilogy. Um, and I'm, you know, it's it's easy to get really negative about those movies. Um, they're still a lot of fun, I think, but um, they don't. They're really you can see them that they're missing the structure that George Lucas put so much effort into, hmm. um, in favor of more you know, like easier to digest dialogue and, you know, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, she, Ray, they had a great opportunity that could have made her a chosen one character who didn't come from anywhere in particular. Yeah. That was a, a nice thing they set up in, in particularly the episode eight. You thought you had this divine heritage and this, uh, you know, all of this stuff, but you really don't. Um, there was a couple of ways in which they, they didn't quite execute that the way they should have, I, th I think. Yeah. Um, but 
they just dropped it. They just completely dropped it at, at the ninth one and said, well, actually, you're a Palpatine. You know, I'm like, oh. that was so that was the weakest was part so of that whole yeah. thing. It was, it was really I was just like, come on, nobody believes that. <laughs> Don't give me that. Don't give it somehow Palpatine return, you know. <laughs> you gotta give kudos to Oscar Isaac for delivering that line oh with God. such sincerity, you know, but he's a fantastic actor. But yeah, so that's that's an example of the chosen one not done exceptionally well, mm-hmm. to put it nicely. Um, but yeah, I think kind of getting back to the original observation though, is that um the, the chosen one, it's the power, but also the duty is an aspect of it that maybe is not not emphasized as much as maybe it should be. Because if you do have a destiny, if, it, if the universe is picking you to do something, then there's also the sense of duty that you should be doing it. All right. Everybody wants rights, but nobody wants to talk about responsibilities. Right. right. <laughs> That's how the saying goes. Um. So that's another piece of it. And I think that gets tied into the, to the narrative of the chosen one in the sacrifice. Very commonly, they have to make some big sacrifice for the, for the larger group. Um, and that's a, a way of expressing their willingness to commit to that idea of service to others. Yeah. Again, in a very exaggerated way. Because, I mean, not everyone is called to die for the rest of the planet, right? Again, the Jesus motif, that the Jesus version of the story is the highest stakes possible. Well, that's one aspect of resonance, very high stakes that sticks in your mind. It's just how we are. Um, But if we're going to tone that down for the rest of us mere mortals, right, then it's just the idea of having particular gifts or talents or a, a destiny or purpose means that you should Use it to help others on some on some level, yeah. and then maybe it's not just everybody, right? Because you know, there's a lot of people out there that are schmucks and they don't need, they don't deserve my help. <laughs> maybe I feel that way, you know. I've had people like that, of course. Oh yeah. Um, and maybe it's just okay. I'm devoting to all this energy to my family, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, but uh, it, again, it's if you just focus on the power. You get completely yeah. lost in that. Uh, oh, I'm just the strongest and the best, and I'm, you know, yeah. going super saiyan, just right. taking over the planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a. It, I think that the one, the whole, a journey towards wholeness, right, is is finding that purpose within yourself, and then allowing it to flow out, and that yeah. that is in direct relationship with the people in your life, mm-hmm. um, with with humility, with. Uh, you know, with gratitude, yeah, it's a way to do it in a balanced way that won't lead to inflation and self-destruction. Yeah. Right, right. But, um, and, and again, like you say, a balanced way, because the, the other thing about it is the inflation bit, is that it can also lead people to overextend. And we haven't talked about that, but that's an also, another thing, right? If I have this yeah. purpose, that means that I have to do this. At the expense yeah. of myself, right? This was... And this I saw also in this, the same person I was working with, with the, the, the animal rescue. Mm. She would go to immense lengths, well beyond any what anyone else would do, because mm. she felt like she was the only one who would who could do it. So there was a bit of a negative inflation in that. I was yeah. like, whoa, 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 time out here. You can only do what you can do, right? If you push yourself to the, beyond your limits and hurt yourself physically, which she did. Yeah then you're not going to be able to accomplish your mission, right? It's just logic. <laughs> so you've got to take time for you, right? And, and some people, they just, whatever, for whatever reason, they were raised a certain way or they just, it's part of their makeup. They have to learn how to do that, how to not give too much, how to give freely and generously, but not excessively. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's another part of the chosen one thing. Yeah, How much you, are we going to ask of the chosen one? That's that's a fair question. That's what Jesus Christ Superstar was about, I think. Right. If you've ever but, seen that or or listened to. Oh that. yeah, yeah, yeah. yep. Yeah, very powerful version of the story. Well, it's so why why is there an over identification with the ideas of sacrifice that are associated with that? Like, it's, and I, I think that's really in a an important question to ask because 
I mean, there's a lot of information out there in terms of this kind of blind set eye and understanding and, you know, you have purpose, this, that, and the other that kind of is taken advantage of and coinciding with that is like bearing your cross, you know, and, and, and all that. And it's a very kind of gloom, dim, like really just unhealthy way of looking at purpose, right? As it has to strictly correlate with you sacrificing yourself. Right. Right. And yeah. I think where like, is that written? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You bring up a really good point in, in saying, well, yeah, it is a giving of yourself, but it isn't giving your life in, in, yeah. in kind of ending your life by just giving it all away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And to think that to think that you're the person to save the world is highly inflationary, that you're mm -hmm. the one person to save the world is just it, it, no. No, um, it's excessive. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's too much to ask of yourself. It's too much to ask of anyone else. Mm -hmm. It's it's not it's not balanced. No. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of nuance in this. And that's you can see why it's such a powerful motif. Yeah. I think yeah. Um, once you start thinking Great. about this. So that's what I got. That's what yeah. I got. Yeah. This it's is what I stuff. got today. Good stuff. Uh, so yeah. Um, Tune in next time. Uh, who knows where we'll go? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> maybe, maybe things will get a little bit spooky. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Goodman. I, uh, I always appreciate these conversations. Thank you for letting me be on your channel. All right. All right. Wouldn't have it any other way. I'll I know. You. I know. All right. See you guys next time. Bye-bye. We'll see you. Bye.